Hi, y'all. All right, let's see here. Let me take a few minutes, get my technology working. We'll get a couple more people here and get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Then I should stop recording. Let me, uh... Welcome back. <laughs> Hopefully you've all completed the um, Connect Four board assignment where you created a Connect Four class and then added functionality to that class that allows players to actually play the game. Um, what we haven't done is created a virtual player, a computer player, that will play the game against us. So that's the goal today, is to add to that functionality by creating another class where, um, that represents a player. So we're gonna have the board class, which we've already made, and then the player class, which creates this virtual player. And then we can have the player, we can call the player class when the board class asks us for a move, we'll call the player class to intelligently make that move. And then we can have the computer play against itself, or we could have the computer play against another person, et cetera, right? So that's the idea today, is just to talk a little bit about some really, really, really basic artificial intelligence strategies in playing games. This is like the most basic artificial intelligence strategy you can imagine. Um, Obviously, artificial intelligence is a huge area that is undergoing a tremendous revolution now. Everything, all our smartphone apps, a lot of the programs we use these days have a lot of artificial intelligence technology now built into them. Um, certainly anything that understands your speech, that's all artificial intelligence based. And that's all different algorithms that are um, sometimes very, very complicated. And what we're doing is just the tip of the iceberg, very first kind of artificial intelligence which is just having the computer play a game where it just looks ahead a certain number of moves. So it's going to be intelligent in the sense that it's going to look ahead three moves and make its move now based on what it's seeing three moves from you. And that'll be a parameter you can set. You can have it set to look ahead five moves. But one of the things you'll see is that the more it looks ahead, the slower it moves because it's got more possibilities to look through. And so for practical purposes, probably looking ahead three moves is enough. And it actually will simulate playing with intelligence when you do that. Okay, so that's the idea today, is to build an intelligent program to play Connect 4 by looking ahead a certain number of moves. That's all we're going to talk about today. All right. So, um, you know, obviously the stupidest artificial intelligence you can possibly make would be something that's not intelligent at all, it, but it does have at least the capability to play the game. And in Connect Four, playing the game means you make one decision. You pick a number between, um, in this case, zero and six, and that represents your comp, and that's your move, right? So the most basic way to have the computer play the game is to tell it to randomly pick a number between zero and six. And there you've created a, a, a non-intelligent that's about as non-intelligent as you can get, but it, but it is a program that would play the game is to just have a random number generator that generates a number of two zeros. So what we want to do is something a little more intelligent than that. Um, and um, we're going to make this a deterministic algorithm, which means there's no randomness. So there will be situations where the computer won't be able to decide what move is better than what. So even if it's looking ahead three moves, it may not see a clear path to winning or at least blocking a win from its opponent, in which case every move looks the same as every other move, in which case um, 
maybe column three and column five, it won't be able to decide which one's better. And so we are um, gonna have it uh, just always pick the one that's as far left as possible. So what we're gonna have it do is basically look ahead a certain number of moves and score the columns based on what it sees three moves from it. Okay. Some of the columns it will rule out because it knows, hey, if I move there, then in the next move, my opponent will win. Right? So certain columns will get moved, ruled out, and then certain columns will remain, and there'll be ties as far as the computer's concerned because it's only looking ahead a certain number of moves. And then it's always going to choose to move left if it has a tie between possible columns. Okay? So that's what it means there by a play as far left as possible, meaning if two columns seem equally good, it's gonna always pick the one on the left. So in this situation right here that you're seeing on the board, um, if we look at, um, let's see, what, what's going on here? This is, uh, neither player has won yet, I think. Please stop, I'm not very good at staring at these Connect Four boards. So please, I, I need to pull up a chat window. So somebody just yell out if, if I'm not seeing something that I should be seeing. But, Let's say it's X's turn to go, and um, I don't see any immediate win for X. Oh, there is an immediate win for X. So an immediate win for X would be right here, right? So if we don't do that, let's say we're O's turn. So if we look ahead one move, then it's clear what to do. Um, if it's O's turn, then the right thing to do if it's still, oh, I see somebody wrote in column three, good. If it's O's turn, then the right thing to do is also to move in column three, right, to block that win. So if you're playing with some intelligence, then, it, then O would move in column three. Is that right? Oh, no. Now people are writing in something that I didn't see before, which is that O's already won. Thank you. I told you I'm bad at staring at these boards and seeing the different diagonals. And Whatever. Okay, those are already won. So if it's so, um, oh, so the answer who won? Oh, X. Oh, I see. Oh, one. Now I'm understanding that question. <laughs> who already won? Not not what happened. All right. Um, here's some quick code again. If you just wanna, if all you wanna do is program a random player, then here's how you would do it. And one way to do it is start out by saying column equals minus one. That just sets column to be a variable that's not going to be used because we're about to change it. And then um, we're going to enter this while loop. This while, the purpose of this while loop is to keep choosing columns randomly until we find a column that's allowable. Right? So call equal random choice. So we pick a number between 0 and 6. That's what the range function does. Right? And then we call that allows move call function there to see, is that choice we just made allowable? If it's not allowable, then we do it again, right? Because this is a wild loop. It's just gonna keep looping. We're just gonna keep picking random numbers until we find one that is allowable. Once we find a column number that is allowable, then we add that move. And then if we want the computer to keep playing against itself, it's got to switch. If it was playing as X, now it should play as O. If it was playing as O, now it should play as X. And that's what's going on over here. As long as you're O, you switch to X, and as long as you're X, to switch to O. So the computer can just keep playing randomly against itself, right? So that's, again, that's like the stupidest possible algorithm you can imagine. It's just play randomly. Keep choosing columns randomly until you find an allowable column, and then go there. Tie breaking to the left when possible. Um, and again, this again, we're gonna do just, just a repeat of what I already said. Where we're gonna score each column individually. And if two columns seem equally good, having only looked ahead a few moves, we'll always pick the one to the left. That's just gonna be a conventional use. All right, so um, two basic things. Even if we're just looking ahead, we're not looking ahead any moves at all. We're just looking at the board right now and um, deciding what to do, looking at the board right now in the current state. Then the two basic principles we're going to look at are um, always win if you can win, 
And if you can't win, but you can see your opponent will win in the next move, right? So I guess we are looking at one move in this case, then we should block. So again, we're like, we're done. Yeah, I misspoke a second ago. We're going to look ahead one move, right? If we can win, we're just going to take it. And then we don't need to look ahead at all. If we can't win, but we see the opponent has a win, then we'll at least move there to block. Them, right? So in this board that we're looking at right now, if we are O, we would move in column four, right? Because then O is a win. And if we're X, we'd also move in column four because that would block that win, right? So it's just base, basic, easy, obvious thing to do. Right? So if we just use that simple principle where, uh, and let's say it's X's turn to win, it's O's turn to win, move, then we want, just move in column four, we're done. If it's X's turn to move, then just based on this very simple principle, X would have to go right there in column four, okay? Now, O, now it's O's turn to move, and everything is equally good for O because there are no, all we're looking at right now is, is there a win? No, there's no wins for O's. Is there a place where X is going to win on the next turn, okay? So in other words, are there any three in a row for X? If there are, we're going to block them. Well, there aren't. In which case, every column is equally good if this is our only measure, right? Either win or block a win. So they're all equally good. So now it's O's turn. So O's going to pick the leftmost of all these equally good columns, which is all the way on the left. Right? Now it's X's turn. And X is going to, if X does the same thing, then X would move here. There are more intelligent ways to play, but you can see what's going to happen at this point. That left column is just going to get all filled up for a while, okay? And then, it, we're, then we're going to keep playing here. So it's kind of a stupid thing to do, is to just always either win or block a win if you can't win, and otherwise move on the far left. Right? This is a stupid way to play. If we want any more intelligence, we have to look ahead more moves than that. Don't just look at this move and the next move. Let's try to look two moves ahead and play with some intelligence. <clears throat> right? So this is exactly the point, is that um, the machine is only going to play with a certain very limited amount of intelligence, or it's only capable of looking ahead a certain number of moves. And the only way to simulate more intelligence is to look ahead more moves. That's very different than the way a lot of humans play, where humans play with some intuition, right? So even if you were X in this previous board here, sorry, or O, right, X moved over here. That was the last thing we did. I think a lot of players probably wouldn't make that move because they'd have some, at least some intuitive feel of it. That's probably not the best place for X to go. Right? Without even thinking ahead, it's not really clear why moving in that first column would gain a lot of advantage. Okay? Maybe, maybe a really good player would see a, a compelling reason to move there. But you know, humans play with some kind of intuition. They have some, some sort of intuitive style of playing where they might get a feel for what, what one move is better than another. And we're not going to be programming the computer to play with any sort of feel. Right? The computer's just going to do something stupid. More advanced artificial intelligence algorithms do try to create something like intuition among the computer's part. Right? And you can think very, very deeply, as computer scientists have done, of what do we mean by intuition, and then try to simulate that with the computer. We're not going to do anything like that. <laughs> um, for us, intuitive moves, it's just going to mean we look ahead more and more and more, and then it's going to look like we're playing with some intuition. Okay. There's a lot of history here. Artificial intelligence is almost um, is is really intimately tied to the history of the computer itself. Um, I have uh, said the name before in class. Um, I'm kind of blanking. That's what happens when we get old. Well, it's going to come up again in a minute. One of the early days of, um, of one of the early accomplishments of 
artificial intelligence was the first time a computer beat a world champion in chess. Uh, it's a famous match between Garry Kasparov and this computer made by IBM. You can see it was a giant computer um, that was nicknamed Deep Blue, and its sole purpose was to be able to play chess. That's all it did. And lots and lots of engineers at IBM worked on building this machine just to do this. More is just kind of a proof of concept that, um, that computers were capable. And Deep Blue used a relative, my understanding is that there were some heuristics, some sort of rules that um, it played by, but the most important thing Deep Blue did was just look ahead many, many, many moves and try to see all the possibilities many farther moves ahead than its opponent. Um, it, it won, Kasparov won in 1996, and then they went and uh, rebuilt the computer or added some functionality to the computer, and then finally the computer won in 1997. It was a, a crazy story. Um, Deep Blue evaluated over 200 million positions per second. Okay, so it was looking at, uh, you know, in a couple of minutes, it was looking at lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of possibilities for the number of moves ahead it looked. Um, it looked ahead 17 to 18 moves. You see this word ply here, P-L-I-E-S. That's going to come up all day today. Plies are just the number of moves you're looking ahead. So it says it move, look. It was looking at a depth of 17 to 18 plies. It was looking 17 to 18 moves ahead. If you think about the number of possible possibilities in a chess game for the next 17 moves of any given chess game, it is tremendous. It is a huge. That's why you have to evaluate millions and millions and millions of positions if you're going to look that far ahead. And it's kind of amazing that it took looking that far ahead to beat Kasparov, right? That humans are capable of playing um, and beating a computer that would be moving 16 moves ahead. Humans don't evaluate that many millions of possibilities. So somehow the way humans play is superior to a strategy that looks 16 moves ahead. That's kind of amazing. I mean, the human brain is still not understood at all. Um, after this happened, the so game makers who wanted to, to give the computer scientists more of a challenge decided to create a game using just a traditional chessboard where there were even more moves possible, where the tree of all possible games looking 17 moves ahead was much, much bigger than even it is in chess. So they created this game, Arima. I don't even know. I don't know much about it other than the slides from this, this class. Um, and it's going to come up later in the class. I guess it's been, I think later in the class, there's some slides that say that, that even this game has now been beaten by a computer. It's kind of amazing because it's much, much more complicated than chess. <clears throat> um, again, plies is the number of turns it's going to look ahead. In other words, if it sees, let's say you have a computer program that's looking five moves ahead, but it sees a win in three moves. Well, it doesn't have to keep looking past them. So it's really looking ahead a certain number of moves till it sees a win. That's why it says turns to checkmate until it sees a win. If it doesn't see a win, it's going to keep looking ahead more moves up to some limit that's going to be up to the program. So if you program it to look five moves ahead, it's going to look ahead until it sees a win or until it gets to five moves ahead. And that's the number of plies. It's just the number of moves it's going to look ahead. All right. Um, this is the quiz for today. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of things are bad here. I think the instructions are bad. The way this slide got imported onto my computer from PowerPoint, um, I'm using Apple's Keynote, and when Keynote imports a PowerPoint slide, sometimes the formatting goes off. So all those columns are all supposed to be lined up, and all these gray arrows you see are all supposed to point to column three. <laughs> so obviously the formatting here is super bad. Um, and so it's a little bit hard to even read this quiz. But um, what you're supposed to do in this quiz is stare at each of this board. And you're being told that X is, in every case, X is going to move to column three. 
But the reason x moves to column three is different in each one of these boards. Here, x in the first one, x is moving to column three because it's only it's not looking ahead at all. Here it moves to column three because it moves ahead one move. Here it moves to column three because it's looking ahead two moves. So the idea with this quiz is it's more conceptual. You have to kind of stare at this, and I'll give you a couple minutes to stare at it and see for yourself. Why is it that x moves to column three if it's looking ahead the number of moves indicated there? Okay. So I'll give you a couple minutes. I hope that's clear. Um, you can feel free to text me in the chat window if it's, it's not clear. But again, in each of these cases, x will move to column three. Sorry, the formatting is a little, a little hard to see which one's column three. Um, so the formatting is off. But in each, in, in each case, it's looking ahead a different number of moves. And you're just trying to figure out why column three is the right move to make, um, remembering that they're numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's actually the fourth one over to the right. I'll give you a couple minutes to stare at these. Remember also that our stupid algorithm here is going to always move to the leftmost column if they're all equally good. Right? So um, let's just talk about that first one. It looks like x moving in column three is really stupid because then it would move here and then oh, o would move there. But it's moving not looking ahead at all. It's not seeing that move that O will make one move ahead. It's only looking zero moves ahead. And if you're only looking zero moves ahead, then um, these two, all four of these columns are equally good if you're only moving zero moves ahead. So only looking zero moves ahead means you're only looking at the board now and seeing, is there a win? That's all you're doing. None of those four columns have a win. So you choose the leftmost of those columns, which would be this one. So it moves to column three because it's moving looking zero moves ahead, because it doesn't see a win in any other column. So it picks the leftmost of all these equally good columns. Well, I'm, I'm trying to clarify what you're supposed to do on this slide here. Do you see why column three, that's the right move to make if you're not looking any moves ahead. You're only looking for a win. You don't see a win, so you move in the leftmost column, which is in this case is column three. So that's why the computer would move to column three, in this case, only looking zero moves ahead. If you're looking one move ahead, then number one, you're going to look for a win. That's looking zero moves ahead. And you're going to look to block the opponent's win because that's one move in the future. Okay, so you've got to think here, I'll give you a few more minutes. Why is column three the right move for X to make if it's only looking for a win or to block the opponent's win? In this case? And I think it's pretty obvious. Again, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. And then um, here it gets more complicated. Now you've got to think about a computer that looks two moves ahead. It's looking to win, block an opponent's win. And if neither of those are correct, it's looking to it's thinking about how would it move so that the opponent's move would then create a better move for it two moves in the future. Right? That's looking two moves ahead. So again, I'm gonna I'll give you a few more now. Hopefully I'm trying to clarify what, what is expected of you in this quiz. So um, I'll give you a couple more minutes to stare at it.
Oh, shit. And you know what? I, I, I feel like I'm not talking right. The supply stuff really confuses me. I think, I think what I said was now wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's better to correct it now than like three slides from now, I swear. I think ply zero, and I'm sorry, means you're looking zero moves ahead, which means every available column is equally good. You're not even looking to see if there's a win. You're just playing blindly. Ply zero means you're playing blindly. So in that first case, there are four open columns, columns three, four, five, and six. You're not even looking at the board in ply zero because you're not looking at any moves ahead at all. And so you just pick the leftmost of these equally good ones. You're not even looking at the board. You're just looking at all the possible ways to go. That's what ply zero is. Ply zero means you don't even look at the board. You're not looking ahead. You're not looking at the board. You're not looking, if I move here, is this a win? Because then you're picturing the board one move in the future. Ply zero, you're not even picturing that. You ply zero just means you're just playing blindly and you're picking the leftmost of all available. Apply one means you're only looking for a win. You're not thinking about apply blocking the opponent's win. You're just saying, if I move in this spot, will that board be advantageous to me after I make that move? Right? That's thinking one move in the future. Now I'm understanding this better. I'm sorry. This is my bad, right? And now it's, it should be clear why column three is the right, right place to go. It's because column three is right there. And it's giving you this win. One move in the future, it's clear what you should do, why you should move in column three, because one move in the future, that creates a win for you. If you're looking two moves ahead, that's ply two. Now you're looking to win, that's the one move ahead. If you don't see a win, you're looking to block your opponent. That's looking two moves ahead. Okay, so I misspoke before, I'm sorry. So. Um, I think now it's clear to me at least why you would move in column three. It's because there's no immediate win, right? So looking one move ahead, you don't see anything. Looking two moves ahead, you do see something your opponent would do, which is get those four in a row O's. So you would move to block that. So again, you're moving in column three to block that. Right? So that's looking two moves ahead. That's ply two. One looking one looking. I'll say it one more time because I screwed this up before. Looking zero moves ahead means you're just moving randomly. You're not looking at the board at all. Looking one move ahead, you're only looking for immediate wins. Looking two moves ahead, you're looking for wins and blocking your opponent. Okay, where it gets really complicated is moving three moves ahead, and this is where we really have to think about the logic here. Okay, if we move three moves ahead, then we have to put ourselves in our opponent's place, and our opponent is now looking only two moves ahead. Okay, so you gotta think about all the different possibilities here. So let's think about this, okay? If I move in columns, the question is why is column three the right place to go? Column three would be here. Okay, why is that the right place to go, right? Now let's think about what our opponent would do if it's only looking two moves ahead. So what would our opponent do now if it's moving two moves ahead? Where would our opponent go? Two. Yep, column two, because our opponent is gonna block that win because it's moving two moves ahead. Looking two moves ahead is enough to block immediate wins, right? And now that sets us up for moving right there in column two. And then we get, ooh, and then we get this win. Okay, but that requires, seeing that requires looking, playing at ply three, putting ourselves, seeing that column three is the right place to go because our opponent is only going to be looking two moves ahead, which means they're going to be looked to block. Okay? So here's the lesson here. If we want to program the computer to play at ply n, then we should evaluate each column, say, well, what if I moved in this column, column two? Well, now I have to put myself in my opponent who's looking n minus one moves ahead. 
and they're going to evaluate all the columns. And for each of those columns, they're going to say, if I move there, what will my opponent do is now looking only n minus two moves ahead. Okay, so that's how you program the computer to search ahead a certain amount, as you keep basically having it play against itself for some number of moves ahead. We'll, I'll say this all again, hopefully slower later, so you'll see it. Okay. Uh, I don't know why this is here at this point. Should have been two slides back. It's just a little article about um, Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov in 1987. Um, yeah, this quote down here is interesting. I apologize for today's performance, the 34-year-old Russian Kasparov said. After suffering the first defeat, chest defeat of his professional career, I had no real energy to fight. This is typical. It's the first time people lose to a computer, they kind of make excuses for themselves. You know, oh, I was having a bad day. I didn't get enough sleep. I didn't have the energy for it. You know, that sort of thing. Um, nowadays, it's interesting. But one of the things that, um, one, one of the ways in which computers have come full circle and affected humans is a lot of, now that we have all these artificial intelligence programs to play chess, a lot of chess professionals are training themselves by playing against the computer. And their style of play has really changed. And this is an article about, um, let's see, the World Chess Championship in 2016 uh, between these two relatively young champions, 23 year old against the 26 year old, I think the 23-year-old ended up winning, Magnus Carlsen. And um, there was an article here about Magnus Carlsen. And on the bottom, you see it says, um, uh, do, 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 do. he was known as the hero of the computer era. Indeed, a study published on chesspace.com earlier this year showed that in the tournament, Mr. Carlsen won to qualify for the World Championship match and played more like a computer than any of his opponents. So, modern chess players now, these chess programs have really affected the whole game of chess because it's affected the way modern chess players play by studying these games and by playing against computers themselves. Um, this is a poster at the Claremont Colleges for the local chess club. I don't know why this is here in this slide. Um, this was true, by the way, this has happened in, in many, many games. Um, I used to follow online poker some because I taught a class in poker at the Claremont Colleges. I haven't taught it in years. Um, but this was a big thing in online poker. Online poker really started in the around, around the year 2000, uh, maybe a year or two before that. It existed before, but um, especially around that, I forget which year it was, I want to say 1997, something around there. And sometime in the, in the late 90s, the uh, National Hockey League had a strike and ESPN didn't have anything to show during all the time it had blocked out for the National Hockey League Championship. And it happened at the World Series of Poker, which was this big um, yearly poker championship, was happened to be happening at the same time. And uh, so they decided, hey, let's just broadcast the World Series of Poker on ESPN instead of hockey. And it created this, for a couple of years, it created this uh, huge poker craze in the early 2000s. And that's around the time I taught that class and it was super popular. And people started playing online poker a lot and the style of poker play started to really change as uh, poker bots started taking over too. A lot of computer poker programs started coming out and poker players were training themselves by playing against the computer. And it was, it was known to, to really significantly change the world of poker. And people tend to play more like computers. Professional players play much more like computers now. So, um, so again, this is a nice. This is a little story that I that I personally observed. I didn't see it so much in the world of chess because I didn't follow chess, but apparently it happened there too. All right, back to Connect Four. Uh, your next homework assignment is to start to try to program this. Try to just to try to program an intelligent chess player, intelligent computer chess player. And again, the way it's going to work is by, num by looking at um, the, some number of moves ahead. So you're going to program two different methods that are going to be very important. The calls to win method. So that is going to identify which column is a winning column for a given player. Okay. 
So, and then the AI move will be a separate method that will use the calls to win method, which will um, use some artificial intelligence to decide what move to make. Right? And then it will simulate being a player by just picking that call. Right? So we'll talk about how each of those methods are going to work now for the rest of the class, and then you're going to go home and try to program those yourselves. <laughs> you're going to go home. You're already home. Sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, so to do this, we're going to create a new class. We already have the board class, which just sets up the game and allows people to play the game. Now we're going to create a player class, right? So the player, every class, again, has data, which are the attributes of an object in that class. And it has methods, which are functions that you can use to manipulate that data. You've now done this with the date class and with the board class. So hopefully you now understand what I'm talking about. And these words aren't so foreign to you anymore. So the first thing when we're thinking about a player class is what's the data going to be? And there's not that much. It's kind of the obvious things that you would expect, um, and maybe one not obvious thing. So first, X is just what player it is. Are you player X or are you player O? Right? So it's just the character, the single string character that tells you which player you are. Okay, then you, we can play with the default setting for how it breaks ties. So usually we're just going to keep this as tie breaking to the left. And again, all that means is when the player plays, it's going to evaluate different columns and score different columns. And if two columns have the same score, it'll always choose the one on the left. That's what tie breaking to the left means. And you'll be, you're going to create this player class and use it. And once you create this as a class, You'll be able to set that tie-breaking type string to whatever you want. You could set it to tie-breaking to the right if you want. Um, but most of the time, we'll probably just keep it tie-breaking to the left. And then the other thing, the new bit of information that maybe see that maybe is new to you, is we're also going to tell it for this particular player that we are creating. How far ahead is that player going to look? How intelligent is that player going to be? Right? Maybe you want to program a player that plays by looking five moves ahead and compare that to a player that only looks three moves ahead. Now this is going to be really important um, because when we create a player that's going to move five moves ahead, here's how it's going to work. Say it again. It's going to evaluate, it's going to think about what if I move to column zero? Now what will a player who only looks four moves ahead do? Now, what if I move to column one? What will a player who only looks four moves ahead do? So this apply five player is going to temporarily create apply four player to play against. And it's going to evaluate each column by saying, what would that other player do if I move to that column? And it's going to be a recursive kind of thing. Because to figure out what the ply four player would do as a response, it's got to go through the same logic. That ply four player is going to say, oh, what if I move to column zero and I play against the ply three player? What if I move in column one and I play against the ply three player? Which of those is best for me? Once it evaluates what's best, that's what the ply four player would do in response to the ply five player original move, right? So it's this recursive thing that's going to keep building on itself. And so that's why we want to. That's why this is going to be extremely important. We want to be able to set that to a number and change that number when we're thinking about playing against someone else. Okay. So this is again, this is this is how it's going to work. The ply four player is going to look ahead by imagining it's playing against a ply three player and evaluating which column is best. Okay. Apply N player would evaluate which column is best by imagining moving in each column and playing against the fly N minus one player. Good. Oh, let's go back for a minute. Um, how many ply of look ahead would we need for a perfect game of Connect Four? So that term perfect game means let's say you could look ahead infinitely. Okay. Looking ahead infinitely means you understand every possible thing anybody could ever do in this game. What should you do? 
right? Now we can't program a pro computer to look ahead infinitely, but for Connect Four, we don't have to because there's some maximum number of moves. Um, so an actual Connect Four game is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times one, two, three, four, five, six. There's 42 checkers on an actual on, on a check. The, the most number of moves a Connect Four game will last is 42 moves. Because at that point the whole board's filled up, right? So to play a perfect game of Connect Four, you potentially have to look ahead from the very beginning, 42 moves. Now think about how many possible games there are that you have to evaluate by looking ahead 42 moves. Now that's you're still probably talking, I don't know the number, but it's probably millions of possible games. All right, so again, just to reiterate what you're going to be doing for homework, you've already programmed the board class. You've already done this. You've already created all these moves. Okay, now for your next homework assignment, you're going to create a player class that's going to move intelligently. And that player class is going to have a couple of methods. Um, one of the methods is just going to give a score to the whole board, evaluate the whole board, and say, oh, this is a score 50 board or something like that, right? And then it's going to think about um, what the scores for a, particular, for a particular move are. And that's what this is going to be. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what do we do if there are ties between two different scores? What should our next move be? Right? All these different methods are going to be the methods you're going to program to help you, in the end, evaluate the best possible move among all the moves available to you. <laughs> Um, and again, I, this is something that we emphasized at the beginning of the class, and it really comes up a lot in artificial intelligence. Think about the challenge of natural language processing. You've got to get a person to, un, you've got to get a computer to understand a person. I mean, let's say you're talking to your iPhone and you're talking to Siri. You ask Siri a question. Some programmer had to sit there and say, well, how am I going to get my phone? I can get this person's phone to understand their question. And the, the challenge here, the fundamental challenge of computer science is computers only work with numbers. They don't work with words. So somehow everything anybody ever does, if they do it with a computer, has to somehow get converted to a number, to an arithmetic activity. So that's true here in Connect Four. When we say you look ahead a certain amount and evaluate the board, that has to be a numerical evaluation. Your only choice is to come up with some sort of numerical score to compare the two. And that's why we're going to use this scoring algorithm so we can convert good and bad positions into bigger and smaller numbers. Computers don't understand good and bad, they only understand numbers. So that's why it's so important to think about a scoring system. So we're going to, we're going to implement a very simple scoring system okay, where um, a board is going to get scored um, with, e with one of three numbers, either 100, 50, or zero. Very simple scoring system, okay, initially, and then this will be more, a little more complicated than that, right? So in the board on the left that you're all seeing, what is the score for black? Is it a win? Is it something else? We're not thinking about one move ahead or making moves. We just look at the board right now and say, have I just won? That's what Black is saying. Do I see four in a row? Okay, that would be 100. Do I see four in a row for red? That would be a zero, right? Because I just lost. Or anything else. Okay. And I see Max has already written in that the score for Black is 100 because that's a win for Black, right? There's four in a row right there. What about red? The first board on the left, what's the score for red? Is it a win for red? Okay, Jessica says zero, good. Yeah, zero, because it's a loss for red. Okay, so that's one quick lesson here, is in a real game of Connect Four, you're not gonna see simultaneously four in a row for black and four in a row for red. You can't get to that situation because the game would have ended already. So if the score for black is 100, the score for red must be zero and vice versa. If the score for black is zero, then the score for red must be 100. 
So when we're scoring the board, it matters if we're scoring it as player X or as player O, but we can get the scores for one from the scores for the other by just kind of flipping them, turn the zeros to 100 and the hundreds to zeros. Now what about the 50s? In the board on the right, there's no four in a row for black, and there's no four in a row for red, so they both get 50. Right? So if you're trying to think about your opponent, so if I look at a board and I see that board has a score of 100 for me, then I know it has a score of zero for my opponent. And if it has a score of 50 for me, then it has a score of 50 for my opponent. Okay? It's very, very important that we're going to be able to put ourselves in our opponent's place. Because we're going to try to develop a score for ourselves by first scoring it for our opponent. And then we'll know the score for ourselves by kind of inverting it going backwards. Right? Again, the way this is going to work, I'm just going to keep saying it over and over again because I know this is confusing. I confuse myself a lot when I think about this. The way I'm going to evaluate moving in column zero, how good or bad is that? Is I'm going to think about doing that move as a ply n player. And now I'm going to think about how my ply n minus one opponent would score that board. Okay. So that column now will get a score for me, which is how my opponent would score the board after I move in that column. Right? So we're, that's exactly what the scores for is going to help you. Okay, so again, scoreboard is just going to give us a single number for the whole board, depending on what our opponent is. Right? If we're black and this board gets 100, and this board gets 50 if we're black. Right? Scoreboard is just a single number for the whole board. Okay? Scores four is a different function where we think if I move to a particular column, now what's the score? Right? So scores four means scores for a particular column. So the score for column zero, well, I have to think how am I going to score column zero? If I move in column zero, what would the score be? Well, column zero is kind of special. I can't move in column zero. So for columns I can't move to, we're going to introduce a score of minus one. Okay, that's a special one. All right, now if I score in column one, how good or bad will that game be? All right, now here's where it really matters how many ply I'm looking ahead. Right, so this is where I think the zero ply case is the most confusing one. If I'm playing at zero ply, it means I don't have the mental ability to look ahead at all. So I can think about what happens if I go here, how would my opponent score things? But I don't have the ability to look at how my opponent would score things. So I can't tell what my opponent's thinking if I'm playing at ply zero, in which case I might as well just put a 50 here because I have no idea what my opponent's thinking. Again, yeah, so, so if you're playing as a ply zero player, you're going to score every column the same because you can't put yourself in the position of your opponent looking ahead one move. That's just if you're playing at ply zero. If we're playing at ply one, things are different. Okay? Now we're looking ahead one move. And we're saying, if I move here, how will my opponent score the board? Okay. So apply one. Well, again, I can't move in column one. If I move in, in, sorry, I can't move in column zero. If I move in column one, so we got a picture of what happens if I move as a red player right here. Now, how does, now, given that, how does my opponent score the board? Is it a win for black? I don't see any wins for black there. And I don't see any wins for red there. So it's neither a win for black or a win for red. So my opponent would score the board as a 50. Okay, so I'll score the board as a 50. Okay, let's keep going. Let's look at the next column. If I move here in the next column, Again, I don't see a win for black or a win for red. So my opponent would score that as a 50. So I'm going to, oh, so I'm going to score that as a 50. 
Okay, let's keep going. If I go here, that's not a win for black or a win for red, right? So my opponent would score that as a 50, so I'll score that as a 50. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna do one more. Okay, and the next one is if I go here, now I end up with a checker right there. And think, how would my opponent score that? My opponent will score that as a zero. But a zero for my opponent is a 100 for me. Okay, and then 50, 50. Neither of those are any good for anybody. Okay, is that clear? So looking only one move ahead, I get to think about how does my opponent score the board after I've done one move? Okay, now it gets more complicated if I'm putting myself in the two fly position. Okay, so in the two fly position, I gotta go through that logic twice for every square. Again, in the two fly position, we're looking at both wins and blocking wins, okay? So um, I think we'll see an easier way to think about this in the future. So I'm not gonna go through each of these columns individually because we'll see this a little easier. Um, in fact, right here. So let's, let's think about this. Um, looking only, so again, what we're gonna do this kind of logic in a similar sort of way. Um, so, Again, we're trying to understand the scores for function. The scores for function is going to evaluate the scores for a move in any particular column. Scores for column zero, score for column one, etc. Right? So it's going to return a whole list of scores. And it's going to depend on the ply. Now the ply zero means I'm not looking ahead at all. And if I'm not looking ahead at all, every move that is allowable is equally good. So we get a minus one here, because that's not allowable, and all the others are equally good. And I'm not even thinking, are they wins or losses? Because I can't even look ahead that far. Right? Ply one is the easiest one to get your head around. That's the case where I look ahead, imagine I've done that move and decide, did I win or did I lose? Right? And hopefully we all see that in column three there, I won. If I'm red, then in column three, that's a winner. But all the other columns, there's no clear win or loss. Okay. Now if I'm looking two moves ahead, okay, again, I can't move in column one at all. If I move in column three, I win. What happens if I move in column one? Now I'm allowed to move two moves ahead. What will my opponent do if I move in column one? Sorry, yes, column one. If I move in column one, given this board, what will my opponent do? Uh, they won't block my win. Michelle said block my win. Anybody else see it? They're gonna win? They're gonna win. I'm moving in column six, good. good Nick. Right, if I move in column one, then they will immediately win by moving in column six, right? Which means I lost. So if I move in column one, I lost. Same thing if I move in column two, then I lost. If I move in column three or four, I lost. Five, I lost. The only way I'm not gonna lose is if I move in column six and block their win. And so that is gonna give me a 50. Right, I see some people nodding, which is good. I only see the video from four of you. It'd be nice to see more of you, just so I can see if you're nodding or not. <laughs> okay, all right, so looking ahead one slide, here are the answers that we just came up with, and you can see them. And the only thing that's not clear is um, that last column. You'll see the columns are sort of stable. Once it turns to a zero, then it stays a zero forever, right? If I know that that column leads to a loss, I don't need to look any more moves ahead. 
If it's a loss in two moves, then it's going to be a loss in 10 moves, right? And the same thing, once we see 100, then I know if I win in a move, then I'll definitely win in five moves, right? So it's only the 50s that change as you look more moves ahead, right? This 50 turned into 100 after one move. This 50 turned into a zero after two moves. So the question is, when does this 50 turn into a zero or a hundred? And Nick's got his hand up. Does it turn to 100? Yeah, why was it turned well, turn to 100? Because if you go column six, they're going to have to go column three, and then you go column three again, and you win. Yep, good. That's exactly right. Everybody hear that? If we move in column, so we're trying to, to evaluate this block box, we're thinking, what happens if I move in column six? Now, it's a dumb move, right? Because you could just win and move in column three. But we're just hypothetically thinking, what happens if I didn't do that and I move in column six? That's what that box means. So we move in column six. Now my opponent, who is capable, since this is ply three, now I'm thinking about playing an opponent against an opponent who's playing ply two. And a ply two opponent will either win if they can or block a win. Well, here they're going to block a win. They're going to block this win down here, column three. Now it's my turn to move. Now I'm only playing a one move ahead opponent, but a one move ahead opponent is capable of seeing immediate wins. And they see this win right here. So that is a win for me, which is down here. Everybody see that? Do you understand the logic? Right, if we apply three, and we move in column six. Now we think about how applied two opponent would respond. Applied two opponent would respond by blocking the win in column three. And then apply one person will see that diagonal win and move there. Right? So this is how the scores for function is going to work. It's going to return seven numbers in this case. Each number is going to be a negative one, a zero, a 50, or a 100. And it really depends on how far ahead you're looking. There's another way to think about how to program the scores for function. Okay, So the scores for function, you've got to imagine moving in a particular column and how your opponent would score the board. Okay, so if I move, if I'm player X now, X is black, I'm the black player, okay? And I move in column zero first. I'm the black player, so I just moved right there. That's my move. Okay, it's orange in this. It should be like a shaded black or something. It's all shaded black, so you can all see. That's where I moved, and I'm the black player, okay? Now, I have to think about how is my opponent going to score this board, right? Well, my opponent will invoke the scores for a function and come up with all these numbers. One of those numbers is a 100. So which move will my opponent do? If they're seeing a 100, then they'll do that move, right? As long as my opponent sees a 100, then I know that that's a score of one, then this whole board, I'm going to score as a 100 because it's a win for my opponent. I'm thinking about how my opponent would score this. My opponent is going to look at every column, see a 100 in one column. Therefore, there's a winning move for them. So they say, this is a great board. Let's just score this whole board as a 100 because it's a winning board for me. Okay. That's how I'm going to get a zero up here. So 100 for my opponent is a zero for me. If I move in column zero, my opponent would score this whole board as a 100. So that is a losing column for me. So I'm going to put a zero. Okay. Um, let's do one or two more. I don't want to do too many more. If I move in column um, one, I just moved right here, okay? Here are my opponent's scores. Again, my opponent sees that 100, says this is a great board for me, so I'll score that whole board 100 because I have a winning move. 
which means that's a losing column for me. So I put a zero under that column. Now let's look at another situation. This situation, moving in column five, if I move in column five, my opponent scores this all the columns as a 50, which means every column is equally good for my opponent. They don't view this as a winning board or a losing board, so they'll view score the whole board with a 50, which means that whole board is a 50 for me. 50 for them is a 50 for me. Okay. So again, just to summarize, I'm going to come up with my scoring of each column by moving in each column and seeing how my opponent would score each column. When my opponent scores that column, every column, that allows me to come up with a score for the whole board for my opponent. Right? So I'm going to invoke the scores for method in my opponent's place after moving into a particular column. That scores all of the columns for my opponent. Then I'll use all those scores to come up with a score for the whole board for my opponent. And then use that to come up with a score for me for that column. Okay, so there's two functions going on here, right? There's the scores for function, which scores every column. And then it's the score board function, which scores the whole board. And the way you score the whole board is just by taking the maximum of the scores for the columns. Okay, so if I were to move in column two, then down here at the bottom, you see the scores my opponent gives each column. Okay, the maximum of those is 100. So my opponent's going to rate this whole board as a 100. Right? That's the scoreboard function. So I'm going to rate that as a zero. Good. We move on. I feel like it's getting kind of repetitive now, but I also feel like the more I repeat it, the few people I lose at the expense of people getting bored and stopping paying attention, and then I lose those people too. All right. Let's. So just to summarize here, if I'm playing as applied to player, I'm going to make think about making each move successively, and think about how my opponent would score the board score the columns as apply one player. Then I'll use those scores to score the whole board. Oh, sorry, I'll score the whole board for my opponent. And that gives me a score for me. Right? This is now the score for me. That's a zero board for me. That's why I get a zero. It's a 100 board for my opponent, but it's a zero board for me. So the scores for apply to method is going to use the scores for apply one method, which scores all the columns. Okay, let's take a step backwards even more. The scores for apply one method will work by using the scores for apply zero method. Now the scores for apply zero method, we don't have to look back any further because all the scores are 50 for apply zero. 50 or negative one. Right? So the scores for apply zero method will score the allowable columns with 50 and the not allowable columns with a minus one. So the backwards recursion stops at apply zero. Apply zero, you don't have to look backwards anymore. You're just gonna give 50s to every allowable column and minus ones to every you use the apply zero scores to create the apply one scores. You use the apply one scores to create the apply two scores. Uh, Alan Turing, that was the name I was blanking on before. Alan Turing, 1945, one of, he's considered the father of modern computer science, if not modern computers. Um, again, if you haven't seen um, the imitation game, the movie with Benedict Cumberbatch, where he plays Alan Turing, it's, it's quite entertaining and, and you'll learn something. Now, obviously it's historical fiction or historical reenactment, a dramatic reenactment of history, but um, Alan Turing was known as this genius. I've talked about him before in this class. He's also 
Um, even though he was one of the first people to invent the modern computer, he's also credited as recognizing the potential that computers have to one day become intelligent. It's amazing forethought to be the guy to invent modern computers and to think so far ahead to think someday these computers might take over the world, <laughs> right? And um, his prediction, one of his famous predictions was in 1945, he predicted that computers would evolve to the point they were intelligent enough to beat humans within a span of 50 years. And he was damn close, right? That prediction was made in 1945, 50 years later would have been 1995, and it was 1997 that Deep Blue beat Kasparov. That's amazing, right? Um, you might have heard of the Turing test for artificial intelligence. He's, uh, he, he even came up with this test of what he believed it would mean to create an intelligent computer, a perfect artificial intelligence. And the Turing test is this famous test where a human being sits down in a computer terminal and they're told that computer terminal may or may not be connected to another computer terminal that another human is at in another room or it might be connected to an artificial intelligence program. And they're allowed to sit there and type messages to that other potential person and have a whole conversation with them. And if they can't tell if they're talking to a computer or another human, that was Turing's measure of whether or not we've achieved perfect artificial intelligence. So if we get to the point where we can't tell if we're talking to humans versus computers, then we've achieved perfect artificial intelligence. And that's a pretty damn good test. And the scary thing is we're almost there. There are programs now where um, I think humans have about a 50% rate of being able to attack, detect whether or not they're talking to another human or not. So, you know, you can view, you as a pessimist, you can view that as scary because you've seen too many Terminator movies or The Matrix too many times. Um, or you could think, hey, you know, the ways in which artificial intelligence has enhanced our lives and everything we do and all our phone apps and everything is kind of amazing and wonderful and spectacular. And there's a lot of potential for goodness there too. We shouldn't all necessarily be afraid of artificial intelligence. If it's done well, it can really enhance our lives. So, you know, keep both those perspectives in mind. We gotta be careful to stop the machines from taking over, but they can also be incredibly helpful. <laughs> Um, we've been talking in this class about strategic thinking. It is important to understand strategic thinking is not intelligence, right? Intelligence is a lot more than just being able to look ahead five years. There's so many more aspects to intelligence. We're still trying to unravel that and get computers to be intelligent, not just look ahead a certain number of years. Um, humans are interesting because humans play chess, not just by looking up, looking ahead a certain number of moves. Humans actually have a little bit of a lookup table in their head. There's interesting experiments from psychologists where they, um, this is a famous psychology experiment, where they took a bunch of professional chess players and just briefly flashed a chessboard at them in the middle of a chess game. And the, those chess players were able to reproduce the board and some interesting things, some of them made mistakes where they couldn't reproduce the whole board, but they got chunks of the board exactly right, just maybe shifted off by one square. Um, so they're able to see kind of portions of the board that they've seen a million times before, and remember patterns on the board. So humans are very good at remembering patterns. Novices obviously could not do anything. They couldn't, they were just random, but they did. But um, what's more interesting is that if you show a professional chess player a random position of the board that didn't come from an actual chess game, and a novice a random position of the board where the pieces are just placed randomly, they were both equally good at recalling the chess board. So, so professional chess players are really good at recognizing actual chess situations because they've played so many times. So it tells you a little bit about how humans think, and that it is more complicated than just looking ahead a certain number of moves. It's also having a lot of experience in recognizing moves and evaluating certain positions as being good or bad from experience. Um, Connect Four, and, and you compare that to other games, how complicated they are. If you think about the complexity of analyzing Connect Four versus Tic Tac Toe, um, one of the oldest board games known to man is an ancient Chinese, 
game of Go, which I don't know if it's Chinese or Japanese. It's played in both countries. I don't remember the origin. Somebody probably knows. Um, the, we're getting low on time, so I'm picking up speed here. I'm sorry. If you look ahead a certain number of moves, if I look ahead one pi, I'm looking at a move in column 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, if I'm thinking as a two pi player, that move to column 0, I have six positions to evaluate for my opponent. If I move in column 1, I've now got six positions to evaluate for my opponent. Okay, so um, you talk. So game players talk about the tree, the game tree, the tree of all possible futures, and that tells you how complicated the game is. The bigger that tree is, the more positions you have to evaluate if you're looking at a certain number of moves. Um, in Connect Four, the number of branches at each point. In a Connect Four game is seven, right? There's seven columns you can move in. That's seven things to evaluate. And how many branches you see tells you about the size of that whole tree. Tic-tac-toe, there's four. Checkers is only 10. Chess, you've got to evaluate 40 different moves. And then if you're looking playing two ply, for each of those, you've got to evaluate 40 different moves. So you can see that that complexity grows really fast. In Go, there's 300 different possible moves. And as I mentioned, this game, Arima, that was invented just, because, just to make it life hard to compete in. You've got 17,000 possible moves, Jesus, at each ply. Um, Connect 4 was actually solved. Obviously, chess was solved, and Connect 4 was solved. Now, by solved, this doesn't mean that we know how to beat a human. That was done earlier. You're going to all program games that can beat most humans. Okay, solved means can you play it perfectly? Can you evaluate from the beginning the entire tree of all possible games to the end and have the computer play perfectly every single time so that no human, no matter how good, and no other computer, no other how good can ever be played? That's what it means to say a game has been solved. Connect Four is a simple enough game that it was solved back in 1988. Um, Checkers was solved in 1989, which is kind of amazing that it was so soon after Connect Four, given that it's, it is much more complicated. Um, here's a nice XKCD cartoon. We've shown you many of these XKCD cartoons throughout the, connect, the class. Randall Monroe is a cartoonist who has a background in something, math, computer science, physics, I don't know, because he's often drawing cartoons about math and computer science. He wrote this cartoon, I'll show you parts of it, um, and, and he summarized nicely, and then some of these are jokes that are thrown in, but this is also an accurate summary of some of those, so Connect Four is here. He says it was solved in 1995, which is different than that earlier slide. I don't know actually what the truth is. Tic-tac-toe was solved long before that. A child can solve tic-tac-toe. A lot of kids know how to play tic-tac-toe perfectly. You don't need computers to solve it. Um, when I teach game theory, NIM is the first game I start with. It's a very important game, like especially understanding poker. NIM is a super important game to understand. Um, checkers, uh, he's, he's saying 2007. I don't know what the right number is. Um, computers can be top humans. So these are the ones that are solved where computers can play perfectly, as opposed to a game like chess, where they can't play perfectly, but at least they can beat top humans. Um, Computers can beat chop humans in chess, and these dates are accurate. 1986 was the first time a computer beat a top human. But at that time, humans were still winning sometimes, just the computers are winning sometimes. And in 2005, it's the last win by a human against the top computer. So since 2005, now computers can beat all humans all the time. Um, Computers sometimes win and still sometimes lose in poker. Um, Arima, I guess now computers still lose to top humans, but I'm assuming by this, maybe they'll win someday. Go, I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Go is now, humans have beat, computers have beat Go, humans at Go. And now I think we're at the point where this slide is outdated. I think human Go, computers can now consistently beat the world champion Go players. Um, 
And these are funny Calvin balls, a made up game in Calvin and Hobbes that computers will never be able to win. And uh, snakes and ladders, computers can win and humans can win because it's totally random. Nobody has control over dice, right? Um, I encourage you all, if you have Netflix, especially streaming on Netflix is a game about AlphaGo. I think it's just called AlphaGo on Netflix. I don't remember um, what it's called, but it's a, a short documentary. I think it's only an hour about Google's AlphaGo program that beat their world championship Go player. It's a, this was a huge accomplishment in artificial intelligence. The fact that we won computers, we, the computers won the game of Go against the world champion was amazing. Um, and here, I think this is our last slide, just for entertainment, Calvin Ball means you just kind of make up the rules as you go. And obviously, computers aren't going to be good at ever making up the rules as they go and dealing with that level of ambiguity. All right, so good luck on your homework. Good luck programming artificial intelligence. Connect four players. And I will see you all in class next Tuesday. I'll be in my office hours tomorrow. Um, oh, sorry, today's Thursday, damn it. I'll be in my office hours Monday and lab Monday afternoon for you all to work on this if you need help. Last minute questions? All right. See you all later. Thank you.